Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Woo, there we go. Wake up. Yes. Did anybody enjoy their lunch? Yes. Okay, so if you did to one of my things that I do, what is one of my favorite things to do? Eat free food. <laughs> and then get free education. So obviously the uh, three musketeers here, or the three amigos, or the three blind mice, three old men, uh, did such an amazing job last time that you asked them to come back and they were happy to oblige. So I hope that you have questions ready, that um, you can, because we'll ask questions and stuff. So whatever you want to do, take notes, ask questions, because this is probably one of the best educational opportunities. Have they learned anything in here? And that they learn something every day because the rules change every single day. That's what I learned last time. They no, they were actually here in February. You slept. I'm just saying. So, all right. Bill just asked me why I was flipping him off. There we go. So, with no further ado, here is our appraisal panel. Hey y'all, I don't know who we are, I'm Bill McKeever, Bill, I think we've been here enough, y'all probably all know who we are. Okay, uh, okay, y'all okay, okay. got up this morning, thank God, it's a beautiful day. Yeah. What a blessing. How many of y'all been licensed more than two years? Okay. Um, how many have had a, an appraisal that's come in less than contract? Those of you that have them, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. It's, it's definitely on the way. Um, I don't mind these two guys sitting beside me because both of them came in on the appraisal for one of my listings less than contract price. They didn't sleep good for a night or two. <laughs> um, how many of y'all have actually put your eyes on an appraisal report and, and actually read through it and looked at it? Okay. I suggest you do more. Ask your buyers to send you a copy of their report. Look at it, read through it. You'll, you'll get a good understanding of what type of information you have to put in there. Uh, how many of y'all have ever taken an appraisal class? Okay, just a few. Okay. Um, when do y'all know how to communicate with an appraiser during a real estate transaction and what questions you can ask and what you cannot ask? Okay, very few. So I ask all these questions to kind of get an idea of what we need to cover today. So that tells us a lot. Um, I think uh, at this point, Neil, I'm going to give it to him and let him, uh, again, doing some uh, computer searches, public records, MLS searches. Uh, maybe McKeever and I will have a Q&A on those while he's kind of going through those and explaining. Uh, we've got a big crowd. Just hold your hands up if you do have questions. We're going to make this very informal, uh, friendly. Uh, Q&A goes a long way in these. I think most people get more out of that than they do us just giving content. So uh, just hold your hands up. We have multiples. So we'll get to you as soon as we can. See? All right. Uh, everybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay, good deal. Um, how many, is everybody familiar with how to get to the public record site for DeSoto County? Um, DeSoto MS.info? Um, that's basically when we, or at least when I get something in, that's one of the first things that I do is pull, pull that site up. Um, I, look, I look at a lot of things. Number one, I'm, I'm looking for um, make sure it's right. But also, yes. We cannot hear you. Okay. How about now? Is that better? Hello. All right, here we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right. Um, one of the first things I like to do is I, I like to pull up the site and just kind of see what I'm dealing with, uh, especially on the GIS. We're very fortunate to have that kind of information at our fingertips, and it gives us a lot of data that we need before we even go out. Um, and I'm going to kind of go over a lot of this stuff. We've got zoning implications. We've got um, easements, encroachments. Um, Flood zone status, flowage easements. We'll get into that here in just a little bit, I guess. But all of this is right here at our fingertips uh, through the DeSoto County site. And there's, there's, it's, we're very fortunate to have that. So 
Um, I like to do, do my own address search. Um, you can search by name, you can search by subdivision lot. And some of the new subdivisions, you actually have to go in through the Chancery Clerk side, and I'll show you that just a little bit to get in, get some partial information from it, because uh, it's not going to be on the assessor site until the next tax year. So you have to go in through the, uh, through the Chancery Clerk side and pull up the lot number by subdivision, and then it'll show you the new parcel number and all that kind of good stuff. So I'll show you that here in just a minute, too. Um, pick an address, somebody. site it, it's it's kind of like a postal service you know you got nine thousand different spellings of the same street um, so if if it doesn't pull up I like to just do the road name itself first Bethel because if you put Bethel R or, or Bethel Road stuff it depends on it won't pull up so you just have to wait and see how the, the assessor has that data entered in their system so if you don't pull it up real quick just keep going to, to the next 20 until you find it it'll be here eventually 91 what? 91 See how they changed names just then? So they went from Bethel RD and then now it's Bethel Road. So you just have to keep searching for it. There it is. All right. So as you can see here, this is telling us a lot of good stuff. Um, owner, legal description. Um, Approximate lot size. Now, some of that can be right, some of it can be wrong. Uh, gives us our year built. I'm going to go and address this blind animal in the room real quick. Um, see these numbers right here? The base and adjusted. That adjusted area is not the square footage of the house. It is not the square footage of the house. I've had two instances in the past three months where I've, I've had appraiser or houses measured three to five hundred square feet less than what was being advertised in the MLS. And both, all of those, the uh, agent used the adjusted square footage from, from the assessor's office. And needless to say, a lot of homeowners were very mad at me, but I had to explain to them the reason why. Is the, the agent used the adjusted square footage. Again, that's not the square footage of the house. Um, gives us our year built, um, section township to range, uh, the assessed value, gives us some age of our outbuildings, anything like that. Um, you can also go right up here. Yeah, before you get off, yeah, keep going. One thing, the uh, the names, the ownership. A lot of times you'll see these names on the ownership on the tax record, but that may not be who actually owns the property, y'all. Tax records run a year behind. Always go and search a deed. Look on the deed to see who actually owns that property. A lot of times they're in a trust, uh, estates, and so if you're just using this, you're getting ready to write an offer and you're going to use for information for the names, you may not be correct. And Neil will show you how to get the deeds. All right, let me write this down. I'll take it. Hey, year built. If it says zero, 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 so down there on that line three, I'm honestly not sure what that Mitchell or. The metal building? Yeah. That's what that is? Okay. Yeah. The metal building? Out there it says zero, 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 zero. So if that's, they're saying that was built in the year 2000. And it may have been, we're not sure. But if the assessor does not know what year it's built, they'll also put four zeros. So if it's a subdivision that was built around 2000, it's a good assumption it could be built in the year 2000. But a subdivision that was built in the 60s and they have four zeros, don't assume that was the year 2000. That's a good point. Right, I've called the assessor's office a lot of times on homes that have zero, 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 zero on it and asked Jim you know, to look at that point. They usually have it, it's just that answer here. But what if they don't have it? I've had it. I've had cases where they don't know. And sometimes they don't. That's correct. Yeah. And what I do on those cases is I, I'll go back to the deed search again and I will put a, a, a time parameter on the deed search. And you can start seeing when those deeds first started hitting. Um, you know, however long the, the records go back into the 60s. And so you can see like, when it transferred over to somebody else, then you can sit and watch again and look at the deed of trust file immediately after that. That lets you know that's probably when the house was built about that time. Um, so 
So there's a lot of investigating that goes on in some of this stuff. Um, and I will say this too, I ran across an incident the other day, I don't see anybody involved in this situation. I, I'm not gonna give you particulars, but um, I went out doing an appraisal on a piece of property and when I walked into it, I said, this is a manufactured house that's been built right here. And I mean, I, I've been in 100,000 houses, so I know, you know, you can tell. The tax card had it as a residential house. So I called Jeff Fitch. I said, Jeff, can you send me the card? And uh, sure enough, it said on the card, home home. Um, but the computer said single family re residence. So uh, a lot of times you do have to do a little bit more research to find out what you're actually dealing with. And the, the tax card will always have what was originally put there. And then they'll have it, you know, either added on, removed, built around or whatever. So it's just kind of one of those things. And then um, that thing's having trouble getting financed for that very reason. So that's one of, that's a huge implication of what we have to deal with uh, on, on our side of it. Can I ask a question? Sure. So at any point, will that mobile home become a residential? Okay, so always, even if you're building around it. And it just, uh, that's, a, that's a rough go. It's, it's, it's once a mobile home, always a mobile home. Yes. And a lot of times with those two, depending on the age, don't qualify for financing anyway. This one was grandfathered in, but a lot of the zoning don't allow it in there. So that's it gets it gets gets in the woods real 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 bad sometimes. Um now that we see this here, you know, obviously this is your parcel number at the top left. Um I know, especially on your land listings, I really appreciate it when you put a parcel number in there because if I'm going and trying to search for in the GIS for a, because uh, a lot of times it won't have a street address that I can search it on, but if I'm trying to find out uh, road frontage, uh, if it has any easements, if it's got any, you know, anything like that, I can pull it up by parcel number in the GIS and, and that helps tremendously. Um, tax records or tax, actual tax bills. So when you go to the tax records, you can look it up what the current taxes for the current or the, the previous tax year are. Just type in 9180 and then I'll just do B, hit search, and there you find it there. Is this property here? And you go down to the bottom and it'll show you number one, it'll show you see where it says less credit. That's gonna be your home that lets you know if they're signed up for homestead exemption or not. You'd be surprised at how many houses that, that I look at, and I'm sure these guys do too, where people don't aren't taking advantage of that homestead credit. Um, then this shows you the tax bill for 2022. It's paid on uh, January 28th, $1,550.05 for the 2022 taxes. So that's where you get that information from. And this gives you, you know, if not that this is really pertinent, but it gives you millage rates for the city, the county, school districts, things of that nature, gives you your millage and stuff. Um, some of the bigger, bigger clients ask for that sometimes but it's usually not, not that big of a deal. All right. Now, we just go back now to the GIS. So to get to our GIS, we'll click on this bottom link to click for GIS map. Just hit it set. And this pulls up ton of information that you can use. Um, obviously you got the, the, the lot lines are drawn out. Um, but you come over here to see this little what I call the pancake stack. This is our this is our layer information. Okay. So in, in this, uh, well first thing first thing I like to look at, especially in a newer house, this thing will verify your address for you. Whatever the 911 address is that's listed on this on this sheet paper on this uh, particular uh, program. Then you can come over here, you can do two or three different things. I'm, on, I'm not going to, the first thing you can do is number one, look up your aerial view. Um, go to base map, and then you can just, I always use the most recent map, but you can also go back and look. Uh, we do this a lot. If things have changed with the property, we'll go back and start looking at aerials from past uh, times to see what's changed, what hadn't. Um, but I always go to the first one first, and it'll give you an aerial view. And then you'll be able to kind of dial this baby in a little closer. Got one thing on this: be 
these property lines that are marked, these overlays are not meant to be actual property lines. They're close, but if you see one running through the edge of a building, don't freak out. It, 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 that's, that's, that's probably not true. It's not meant to be a survey. It's more of a, a visual, uh, just to get an idea of where the property lines are. Yeah, because it, it shifts. When these things are, are flown, the lines will shift. Now, I have seen one where the house wasn't even on the property, and you know that that throws up a red flag to us. We may call for a we may call for a survey or something on that one, but uh, uh, I have seen that actually. Um, and then you can look at your driveways and stuff like that. But one of the main tools that I, that I myself personally like to use with this is is it gives me an idea of what the land topography is. Um, you know, because back in the old days we would have to go walk this whole three acre track. I'm not doing that anymore. I don't know many folks do. <laughs> I use, I use, there's more data on this aerial view than I can get by walking around looking, you know, not getting every little square inch of it. Now, I do walk around and make sure there's nothing there, but I'm not going to go corner to corner and transverse the whole track. Um, I get more out of this than I can anything. But then you go over here to where it says layers, and this is where all of our information is. Let me back this bad boy up a little bit. Uh, that's too much. I'm not used to these things here. But you click on the little triangle right here. And it brings up a list of just mountains of, that, of data that we can use and uh, that's, that's just at our fingertips. Um, for the, one of the first things that I like to look at is zoning. I click on that. Why is zoning a big issue? Well, it, it plays a lot about the property. It tells you a lot. What we have to do as far as our highest and best use, if, if, if it's not legally permissible, meaning it has to conform to zoning rules, then we have a problem. Then it, it goes directly impacts our value. But I look at this, you have an AR zoning. We know off the top of our head, it, it, the minimum lot size is an acre and a half without community or public water. Um, with community and public water, they will allow one acre lots um, under that with public sewer, but you still have to meet the zoning requirements for that. You may run across a, a half acre lot that's zoned AR that has a well and septic on it. That's what we call a legal non-conforming lot. Uh, but that does play an impact in how we have to address, like I said, our highest and best use, and that does have an impact on the value. Um, and there's certain things you can do in certain zoning areas and stuff like that. But that that's a big thing. Then I also like to go and use um, one of the biggest things, in, in my opinion, in our market uh, area is school districts. Uh, I don't pay a big attention to the elementary schools because the high school, is, in my opinion, are the biggest factor um, in certain markets. So I'll click on the high school district and it will show up which school district this is in. Let me take the area law so you can see it a little bit better. So this tells you now it's in Lewisburg School District. So you can back it out. And I have these saved in my computer and I include these in my reports to, to define the market area. Uh, but there, there you can see the school districts are clearly marked um, by each individual lot. So you, you know what you're dealing with. Especially when you start getting on these borders right here, you know, they're not, not a big difference in DeSoto, uh, Central and Lewisburg, or Hernando and Lewisburg, but you know, one side of College Road or the other could make a big difference in, in your valuations and stuff like that, depending on your lot values and things of that nature. So um, we look at this very closely, and that's that's another thing that I, I literally use on a daily basis or on a, just about every report. I don't know. We would have to call the county, I guess, to see that. Yeah, I think the school districts are are correct. I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. Um, we'll, I'll pull that up in a second. So, Neil mentioned like one on College Road. Did any of y'all ever listen to the property along College Road and the line where you're in between Lewisburg and Paul Branch or one of those? So, I called the uh, Transportation Department at the Soap County Schools and found when I listed the property on College Road, if the school bus runs on College Road, regardless of which side of the road it's on, and if the property has a college road address, it goes to Lewisburg School. I would say, I'm not gonna tell you that's the case with everyone, but if that does come up, college, Malone, those roads that border those school districts, 
call the transportation department and they can give you that information. That's, that's pretty vital. Um, somebody was asking about the, the city limits districts. All right, let's go right over here. Um, See those those blue, this big blue line right here? Mm -hmm. Those are going to be your city limit markers. Mm -hmm. So that's that's marked on here mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Back, let's work this out. Okay, see the see the big blue lines? So that's going to be your city limit mm -hmm. dividers and stuff like that. And it, it, it and they are I think they're because that is updated. It is right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, another thing we look at is flood zone status. So you go up here and you see where the little thing that says flood zone? Just click on that. And then this will, this will let you know if the property is in a, inside of a, a, a flood zone. Yeah. See it on the top, but you see the you see those those pink and, and blue and all that. Those are areas that are in the flood zone. So if your if your lot is actually in the flood zone, then you'll be able to tell uh, you know real quick. And then you can pop over the aerial overlay over the top of it, see if your actual structure sits in the in the in the flood zone itself. But anytime anytime I've been dealing with it, any any piece of the property that touches the flood zone probably will have to have flood insurance. Um, and there's always an exception. Yeah. Okay, so I had one the other day. We did this. It shows it in a flood zone. So we go to the actual FEMA site and we pull it up and we go back and pull the subdivision plat on it. And the subdivision plat showed a letter of map revision. They call it LOMR or LOMA uh, with a date on it. And you can go into the FEMA site and see where the developer probably elevated this, the building sites above flood zone when they did it. So the property is no longer in a flood zone. However, for an appraiser and for y'all, you're going to have conflicting information. I always say that, you know, let the lender get a foot certification for the final determination. So just because it shows it in a flood zone and it's under developed subdivision, there may be uh, some revisions that are taking place. I'm gonna go and hit this animal while we're on the flood zone. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, is, does anybody in here not know what a flow adjustment is? A flow adjustment. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, 1941, when they were building Arkham Butler Lake, the Corps of Engineers, the federal government, came in and bought up gobs of land around the lake and floodways away from the lake. They they basically bought the land but gave it back to the homeowners or the, the property owners and they retained what's called a fluid easement. What this means is is that Can you spell that? Yes, F L O W A G E. Mm -hmm. And what that what that means is is that the core reserves the right. And it's, it's in perpetuity, so that means it, it runs forever. Um, the core reserves the right to flood that land at any time without warning or anything like that. <laughs> the, the catch to that is, is according to the federal law, there are to be no homes for human habitation within the boundary of the flow adjustments. Um, now, there are a bunch that are within the boundaries of the flow adjustment. <laughs> <laughs> And, and some, some are, this is where it gets kind of tricky, is you have to call down or email down to Vicksburg to the, to the office. And you have to, dis, have to dis see, there, there are two ways the easements are, are, are done. They're either elevation specific, uh, which means that 
the Corps owns the right to flood up to so many feet of elevation, or they encumber the entire parcel with no restrictions. Um, I've had them both ways. Um, uh, there's a house on Highway 301 that's, that's been under contract, I know, three times, and the lender has rejected it all three times because it was under flow of easement. Uh, the whole parcel was encumbered by the easement with no elevation restrictions, and they can't sell it. Nobody would, nobody would buy the loan. Um, but you see these little pretty diagonal gray lines? That shows you that you're, you're in the flow of easement. I don't see if you can zoom in the Oak Grove. Yeah, I'm trying to get over here this thing. It, I don't drive these kind of miles very well, so. Yeah, let me bounce right over there. So. There are homes that have been built in this, and a lot of your title companies, y'all know one of the attorneys do title searches. They don't go back to 1941 and do title searches, so a lot of these flowage easements have just been overlooked in the past, and the county has even allowed some developments to go in in these flowage easements. There have been some subdivided properties put in place in the flowage easements that the county allowed because they didn't see it. So, in the, in, and one good thing, if you're any of the core engineers, like the core of engineers, is, is who drives this. They're, they're the ones that control it. If you're close to Arkansas, Sardis, Grenada, Keene, if any of those four core lakes here, you know there's a chance that you may be in a flow of these. So if you're dealing with vacant land there, it, it may be great recreational land or agricultural land, but it may not have no, no use as residential. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. If you have title insurance, will that take care of something like that? I think that's an attorney question. <laughs> <laughs> Any attorneys in the, in the building? Uh, I think that would be a question to ask him. I'm not sure. Does everybody, everybody remember the Clifton Road debacle? Clifton and, Oak, and uh, Robinson Gym? Yeah, sold, off, sold off a bunch of 10-acre lots over there. People started building houses. And the court came in and said, no, you can't build a house. Had to tear them down. And the developer had to buy the land back. Plus, Basically, what the, what the yeah, that's it. it it's, it's for recreational use only now. Basically, after that. Now, like I said, there's a bunch of houses that are in it. Like Bill said, there's. I, I can guarantee you, I put the aerial back on this right here, and there's houses all up inside these little slanted lines. Don't assume just don't assume just because your house isn't close to Arthur Butler that it's not in the flow of Jesus. You could be five eight miles away and still be in it. You could be on the east side of 55 and be in the flow of Jesus. 
And the thing that I also, that she did not say, which is no big deal, but a little history to it. Uh, the reason I was told they have this flowage easement is so the Delta doesn't get flooded. So I guess when the Mississippi River rises, they flood, they back up Arthur Butler Lake, and then down 61, the Delta doesn't get flooded. Yeah, so that's why. Yeah, everybody else gets flooded. What was the flooded? I think that might back then. What was the flooding you mean besides flowage? Flood zone. Flood zone. What I do on that, I require a certificate, an uh, uh, elevation certificate on that to make sure the house is above it because I ran into one in Tate County. Um, plans, I was doing all the plans, they already started building the house and it had a flowage easement on it and it was up to, I forget how many feet, and the house was actually being built five feet below the easement boundary. So they had to tear the foundation up, bring it up above the, the, the uh, uh, elevation, minimum elevation in order to make it legal. This is a big deal, and, and so this is one reason we wanted y'all to see this and be aware of it. This, this, uh, since there's so many homes built in this flowage easement, and our Pacific counties allow developments in some cases, there's a mobile home development going out 304 just as you pass that wet bottom on the uh, south side of the road that's got mobile homes in it that the county allowed to be subdivided. And there are mobile homes in there. I had a, a project request on one and through VA, and they, it was, it, it went away. They declined it. Look at the houses inside the boundary. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So you said you could not do dirt and it was illegal, but you said if it's already over the, the, the elevation. Zone. If there's an elevation exception built into that flowage easement by the Corps of Engineers. So if the Corps specifically states in that flowage easement that they have the right the flowage easement is up to a certain elevation. And if the house is built above that elevation, it's legal. But it's gonna require a surveyor to go out and do an elevation survey on it to make sure what elevation the house is at. So the building commission should know that when you go to get there. They don't, <laughs> they don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. They don't. And then there's, then like, like Bill said, you have the elevation, and I've ran into a bunch that are just encumber the entire property with no elevation restrictions. So no matter what, not supposed to be anything there. Um, it gets a little hairy, um, and that, that plays a huge impact on us when we have to factor this stuff in, especially with vacant land. Um, you know, if nobody's going to come in and pay, you know, development track prices for a piece of land if they can't build on it. So that, that diminishes the value greatly on that. I'm not going to get into that a whole lot, but that, 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 that does have an impact on, on market, marketability and market value. Y'all look, look at the houses that are built in. And the, this area has no elevation exception for it. This road is Oak Road. Oak Road Road. That's, that's yeah. east of Arc Butler Lake. Yeah, it's between Arc Butler Lake and Fog Road. Yeah. So can you, can you do an appraisal on a property that's there illegally? No. I won't touch it with a 10 foot pole. No. You can, it just will not be pretty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> most people don't the, even know that they, they, they own the property. Don't even know. Well, most of them know it now. Yeah. They probably didn't then. Yeah. And the Corps is in the process now. Yeah. They're, they have, they've, been, they've got a survey contract out for about the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. They're in the process now of marking the boundaries with markers. Um, little things like you see, like pipeline easements and stuff like that. They're in the process of marking these in Tate mm -hmm. and the Soda County. Right, and I don't know how what their timeline is. My friend that works up there is retired, so I don't know how close they are to finishing up. But. Um, more questions on flowage easements, y'all. Well, one more question. So, if you sold the house for cash, 
you know, somebody wanted it that bad, they pay cash for it. They could still live there, even though it's considered, you know, what, are they grandfathered? <laughs> it's not grandfathered. It's not grandfathered. The Corps of Engineers could technically flood that property at any time if they chose to do so. They can live there unless the Corps of Engineers comes by and says the house is going to be demolished. Yeah. Yeah. No, they have the right to do that. Yeah. No, they do. Yeah. No residents can legally be on that property. Okay. Yeah. Nothing for human habitation. Well, you can have a shed. Or, years they None that I'm aware of, except for the Clifton Road property where they did stop construction yeah. and and they couldn't build a and these people pay they, they pay the price to build a home on it for you know for a residential tract and they the developer and or the owner the seller and I think the attorney had to buy it back. Mm -hmm. yeah. There were a lot of already done on those. <coughs> well, they probably got well, that uh, the attorney had some title insurance on all that. So Most title policies only go back 50 years, yeah. so that's you don't. They, a lot of people missed it because they, their original easements were 41, 42. They went back a lot more to 68 through 70. Um, the county ought to be responsible. Somebody ought, somebody ought to get control. Somebody probably will along the way. <laughs> but the, not us three. Yeah, it's not going to be any of us. We know better. We're going to touch it. Keith and I were talking just a second ago that there's there's no telling how many appraisals that, that we all did and how many houses have been bought and sold and, and mortgages on these properties before we knew about these easements. Um, I know for a fact I did one 20 years ago and had no idea about an easement came and had to do it a few years ago and turned it down because we knew it was an easement now. And y'all look, the, the flow easement is outside the flood zone. Yeah. So even if we, if, if we would have checked it, we always check for flood zone. But the, the, how big they, they're all about well outside the flood zone. Yes, ma'am, I know we got questions yeah. right here. That's flood zone status. It is. Yeah. I think that's more towards Mississippi River. Yeah, that's over the west side of 61. Bill, yes. Randy just brought up a good point. It almost touches my legs. Yeah, that's it. That's very close. It gets very close, yeah, all the way to Montclair. You can see it. You can see how it trickles down into Tate County. Um, everything, literally, like in Coldwater, that's been built along 306, the new service station, all that stuff in there, all that's inside the easement boundary. But when it, when did they flood it? You know, what year they flooded it? I don't know that it's ever been flooded. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if they've ever flooded it. But now, the was they bought the, the right to to flood it, and they put restrictions in of no. Yeah, I'm brother Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's what I did. Now in Tate County that has been it has been flooded before because it runs down Cherrydale subdivision. Um to the back side of Cherrydale subdivision, back behind State Road, and I do know that prop that when they flooded um this the fifty one highway, all that was closed for about two weeks at one time from all the flood, and that's when it did flood back then. Oh yes, ma'am, a bunch. The east and west side of the interstate, mainly around the lake, but you can see see on the uh, see all the little slanted lines there? I've got it blown out, it doesn't give us a good image. What lake are you talking about? Arc Buck. Is this effect possibly affecting people getting insurance on their homes? I would get like insurance, loans, uh if their home is inside there. I don't know if they would cancel or require some additional policy or, or put some exclusion in on their insurance. Don't tell them. As far as the agents are concerned, if y'all get a listing that is in the flow of G-SMIC, call your favorite appraiser or one of them on this one. <laughs> Because you're probably not going to want the listing, but then you're going to need to advise your owner what's going on. Let me show you one thing right here that's good information for you guys to have. I used to be on here. I don't see it on here anymore. Let me dial around a little closer. But you, you wouldn't be able to see all these flood engagement on any. No. No. Okay, all right. You, you, see this, you see this little phone number right here? Arkham Butler Battery Request. 
to construct within the, the boundary must refer to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Vicksburg Office 601-831-7687. You'll, you'll have a wonderful conversation. Yeah, a, a lady by the name of Crystal Spokane, know her by, on a first name basis now. Um, we have an email chain nine miles long. Um, anytime I get anything anywhere remotely close to these things, I call, I email them to get documentation from my file to make sure, you know, I'm covered. Sounds like I'm going to you guys. Yeah, it's uh, 601. 631, I'm sorry, 7687. 601 631 7687. Any other questions? Are you scared? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, what else am I missing? Water. Yeah, utility. All right, a few more things on this, and we'll move on to something else because I know we're getting kind of short of time. Um, I have a question. Sure. Where, the, where it runs down there where it's saying the flood area, mm -hmm. and then right above it, by your box, there's a little golden section. Why is there? Um, that is, that's got to do with some type of the, of the uh, floodways. Um, it, it, different, different colors have different okay. flood statuses. Okay. Um, so it gets kind of. Um, let's see. Let me find where am I at? I think I'll show you the water districts and stuff like that. Just if you ever have a question. That snake is bit. Um. All right. So here's here's your water districts and utility districts uh, map. Um. You got days over here. You got the Eudora Association over here. Um. This will kind of give you a good indication of what who services what. Um, you see the city of Hernando bought out a good bit of that stuff over there now, so it's actually city-owned stuff. You have all, and it butts up to Olive Branch and Lewisburg over here. Um, the sewer districts are the same way. Um, we use this a lot because FHA says in their manual that we're supposed to note anything that's not, a, not provided, serviced by a public entity. So if it's a private, for-profit corporation, we have to mark that in the appraisal and name the name, so we use that on a regular basis. Oh, and with that, VA. If it is a community water system, VA is going to come back and require a water test from uh, water test results from that community water provider. But, but then we have to mark it on there if it's community yeah. or whether it is a public utility. But you have a lot of stuff, and I, I was ignorant to this until I started playing with this a lot. That, you know, there's a lot of the stuff over on the west side that's run by Cohome Power. Um, you know, so uh, it's coming out of the Delta. Uh, the walls area, you see the little green spot, a lot of stuff over at Lake of the Hills, Cocoa Reef, stuff like that. It actually has uh, uh, Coahoma uh, EPA, uh, it's not a power cooperative. Uh, then we see energy, and of course you got North Central, which is another power cooperative on the other side. So um, just a lot of different stuff that can help your clients know who to call in case they needed uh, you know, who to get their services with. Um, a lot of this is on this, on this uh, GIS system. Now, a lot of these, y'all, I have found that it, it may show it on here like Lewisburg Water, but when you call Lewisburg Water to see if they service it, they have not run lines to it yet. So just because it shows it on here, just don't take it for granted. That is the fact. Uh, call, call the Water Association and, and check and see if they service that address. Question on utilities? Sure, I wish coming. we did. I hope they will put it on at some point. Uh, but I think it's being added so so fast through the county. I know at and is, is working hard. Ceasefire is running some. And now the, some of the cooperative PBAs are running uh, fiber optic as well. So energy, I understand, is not going to run. That's from what I've heard. Questions on anything else?
else we've been through so far? Jill, you're going to sleep. <laughs> Sorry, we're, 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 learning each, we're, we're learning from each other right now. So. I'm doing it a different way than he does. <laughs> um, so now we're going to show you how to kind of get into the, uh, to the uh, Chancery Clerk side, deed records and stuff like that. Two ways to do it, you can go dial into it through their little uh, system, or you can get to it through the GIS. And this is what Keith and I were just talking about. Um, once you get the GIS pulled up on your property, you can go over here and see where it says search land records. Click here, and that's gonna pull up the, the Chancery Clerk side of things. So you can do it two or three ways. You can search by their name, you can search by subdivision lot. Uh, uh, you can do section, township, and range. You can do anything. So let's just look uh, the one we had a while ago on uh, the one on Bethel Road. It was lot 31 Lewisburg Farm. So I, to keep it simple, I go to subdivision lot. I type in 31 for lot number. I come down below. I type in Lewisburg. Um, and it would help if I could talk. All right, so Lewisburg Farms Lot 31. Then go down. You can set up a date, a date range if you want to. Uh, you can see here the deeds go back to 1940. So you can search any deed back to 1940. You can do trust deeds, you can do uh, warranty deeds, um, anything, power of attorneys, um, liens, whatever, it's all on here. So in a lot of cases, we'll just do this one and just see how it kind of how, how it rolled out. So you click search and then you come out here and you'll see everything that's ever been done on this property. Um, the first deed was recorded in 1986. Uh, in 1990, they got a deed of trust, so that tends to tell you that the house is probably built around 1990. And that kind of confirms what the assessor data had on there. Yeah, you can click on that record date yeah. over there, and it will switch it from oldest to newest or newest yeah. to oldest. You can so resort it and, and vice versa. See, the last deed of trust on the property was in 2012. Um, you could go down here, go down to the warranty deed, and click on it. These people bought the property in 2012. So you click on the deed, that'll bring up the actual deed. Then you can come over here to the side, you see where it says for reference. Those are the plat maps. You click on that. And then that'll bring up the plat map for the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That's good. And that plat is where if you have one that's in question in a flood zone, this is where you need to go back review the plat look at the written details on it because in the commentary on it it will show if there's been a letter of map revision or an amendment to the flood zone. You could double check zoning on the plat. The older plats are not as good as the newer plats, but you could double check the zoning on these. Um, restrictions, setbacks, um, things of that nature as well. The one thing about the, the, the setbacks should match or it, it has to be at least it can supersede county zoning, but it can't be less than county zoning. So you can go back to here, and then we'll pull up one more thing and show you how you can cross-reference. Let's say you've got a new, new subdivision, and you don't have a, a parcel number yet or, or anything like that. See right here where it says parcel number? You can go right here and hit assessment info, and it goes back right to the assessor card. So you can pull like a, all the new subdivisions, that's how I get my parcel numbers on for any new subject that's not assessed yet. Now, there will be new lots that you will not have a parcel number on yet. So it's not going, it's not going to populate it at all. It gives you a lot of good information, a lot of good deed stuff. Um, you get up around the, the, the Greenbrook area, stuff like that, it'll show you navigation easements. Y'all familiar with those? where the International Airport came in and, and bought up navigation easements, give them the right to fly over the houses. Um, that obviously doesn't impact marketability or value because things are selling every day in Greenbrook, but um, it, it's 
for us, we have to note it and, and determine if there's any impact on marketability or value. Obviously, there isn't. But. And with VA, we have, you actually have to know which zone it's in. You, you think about a lot of veterans that have PTSD, uh, airplane noise can set them off. It can affect them. So we have to we have to actually include that on VA program. And that's and that's why you know the, the little nine hole Greenwood golf golf courses up there. Do y'all remember when there were houses up there? I've actually appraised some of them back in the day. Uh, they were they were moved out. Everything you know through the years that right after they started buying up these easements. It was O two. I think so, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, they they bought out everything that was in within a certain noise level. So if it was above that, like Charter Oak, one side of Charter Oak, they bought out the other side. They did, but it, the plane elevations reached to a certain level where the noise levels are acceptable in somebody's sight. We used to bring it down State Line Road where that car is. I had a client from Pine Nose Right. And you could stand in there. I actually would anticipate them the, the more traffic that's coming in now because like now all the areas like Cherry Tree and stuff like that, Lake St. Nicholas stuff, they got huge noise issues. I would anticipate them probably buying up some more easements here pretty soon because I lived in Cherry Tree for a long time and it, you became numb to it. but. Uh, you definitely knew it at night when FedEx was starting their sort. Yeah. 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 So, um, where I live, uh, I've been there so long, I don't even pay any attention to it. It goes out of my house. You don't hear it, <laughs> Now, if you're looking for just a subdivision flat, you can go over here to name, click on name, and then you just type in a subdivision. Let's just say, I won't say Red Banks Road, but I did one of theirs more. So the Red Banks Road subdivision right there off of uh, Red Banks Road just south of uh, Bahia Road. You come over here and hit S for subdivision. And click done. And then hit search. And that'll pull up every section of the Red Banks Road or anything that starts at Red Banks and deal with the plat. So Red Banks Road section F, you just click on it, hit done, and then there's your plat. that in your, in your listing or whatever if you want. We use it on a daily basis. I keep plats of every subdivision I do things in in a separate file that way I don't have to keep digging through it all the time. So, What else on this guy? The town's gonna come a long way. Yeah. It's very, very fortunate and like, like Bill was saying a while ago, I'm, I'm on the Tate County Planning Commission. Um, we're going live with our use system probably within the next 30 days it's very comparable to the DeSoto GIS system have the same data on there zoning mm -hmm. uh, flood map status flow adjacent status school district status um, things of that nature would be on there and Will all make sure the board has a link to that so sure sure we can get to it I, I could I could probably get to it now um, kind of show it to you a little bit but um, it's uh, we have like I said it's not officially live yet What is the website? Uh, it's TateCountyGov.com. TateCountyGov.com. You can go to Departments. Come down to, I don't want to click on one of these to show you all my little mug. Um, go down to planning, planning and Zoning, and here's another good status here. You know, we all took a beating on this new comprehensive plan down there. Um, but here's our new zoning ordinances. Um, in, in certain zones in Tate County will allow manufactured homes now, certain won't. Um, if they are in a, if there is one already in the area that, that can't that can't have a new one, they can replace the old one in perpetuity. So uh, that, as long as it stays in the same family line, or not the same family line, but as long as it stays occupied. I said that wrong. Um, but these are, there's a lot of good information in here about zoning ordinances and stuff like that for the county. Um, and here's the new interactive map. <coughs> You can also go to it to tscmaps.com. Um, but this shows you the new new zoning maps, the zoning zoning things. We've got flow adjustment boundaries. Um, she works the same way. Get on the pancakes. Um, you can turn on supervisor districts, uh, polling places, fire stations.
We have our road plans on here for future road development. Um, let's see. Yeah, the roundabout. That's that's a that's a sticky situation. Um, I'm excited about roundabouts. It's so dumb. <laughs> I think a bucket of Popeye's chicken and park a lawn chair right in the middle of it would be a good idea on Saturday morning. <laughs> I'm just glad I retired off the fire department because them boys are going to be down there a lot. So here in Tate County, you click flow achievement. You just click on it right here and then we can zoom in a little bit. And, uh, let me go over here and drive this thing a little bit. All right. So you see these little blue lines in Tate County? Those are the flow adjustment boundaries. And you can see it kind of outlined a little bit, if you will, right through there. I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit more. This one's not quite. Uh, I'll just show you cold water. Same little squiggly, same little diagonal lines. How do you drive this thing to make it squirrel? Maybe. Okay, here we go. Oh, get back. That's what happens when you have fat fingers. Yeah. All right. I'm putting a curse this time. Hey, just to note that core phone number is different on that than the one that you gave us earlier. Okay. Just an FYI. Yeah, we'll talk to our, I'll talk to our math and people about this. Um, but you see the little squiggly lines, same thing in DeSoto County as it is here. You can see right here in Coldwater, all that on the north side of Coldwater. Basically everything, for those of you that don't know Coldwater, the whole town was moved in 1942. Um, the town used to sit by the exit, where the exit is now. Um, it was moved to its current location in 1942. Um, my grandmother, who's 97, she can, still, she can tell you where the houses used to sit. So, um, and where they sit now. But, But you can see the boundaries here. You can see uh, floodplain. Then you got the, um, the squiggly lines are the actual flowage easements. Um, so you can see there's each parcel broken down, kind of like the soda is. But this, the, the diagonal lines, same thing, still is flowage easement. It goes down into Senatoga. Um, all along back behind McDonald's, um, where the uh, trailer park is at Hurd and, and uh, Northley, all that's in the flowage easement. Um, like I said, all the stuff was built in cold water. Is that where you can rent a hotel? No, it's not in it. Oh, okay. New hotel's not. It? Yeah, it, it runs over, like around the back side of McDonald's, around where the farmer's market is. Yeah. And back all that, where the main, where the mobile homes are, all that place yeah. back in there is all in the flow of Jesus. Um, <laughs> same thing. It, it, but if you have to call, I'm sorry, I'm kidding. Um, I'm sitting there talking, running my gaps. But, um, <laughs> But some of that stuff is, you know, again, but it, here are the county zoning things. You can click on each parcel. It tells you what the zoning is for each parcel. It breaks it down for parcel number, a property owner, um, anything like that. You can go to it that way. And there will be hyperlinks going back and forth to the to the assessor site, stuff like that. We're just, you know, we're, we finally got a board of supervisors that want to spend a little money and get within the 21st century. So um, I've worked for Tate County, too, so just, for, just for full disclosure. Yes, ma'am. Just growing great. Um, anything else? I think, I think that's it on maps. Y'all have questions on the mapping system? Just call you if we have questions. Call Neil. That's it. All right. Yeah, take it, ma'am. <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk about dollar per square foot very quickly because I know none of y'all want to talk about it. Um, all right, so first off, the bad news is we do not value a house based on dollar per square foot. We don't do anything with dollar per square foot, really. Um, that's where I go back Take to. Take it out of the thing so we won't worry about it. Well, maybe. <laughs> but that's where I go back to what Bill said earlier is read the reports <laughs> and um, look through there and see how much we discuss dollar per square foot. And then in the pre-printed side of it, even if you just want to say, hey, that one particular appraiser doesn't talk about dollar per square foot, Look at the pre-printed form. It's not on there. It's in it's down, I say it's, not, it's in one spot, but it's automatically calculated for us every time we type something in. So, 
to sit here and tell y'all not to value a house by dollar per square foot, I'm gonna tell you to do that. Um, but I'm also going to tell you that I know your general, every seller and buyer works off dollar per square foot. So there has to be some type of give and take with that, I get that. Um, other thing Bill usually says, he did not say, I'll say, Bill and I are both agents, and what we say today is from an appraisal perspective. So don't take this straight home and say, you know, that's by law what you should do. Y'all should all check with your brokers. Um, so I think at some point you've got to start working in, like we extract adjustments out of the market, at least dollar per square foot adjustments. So I recently told somebody, you probably could use eighty dollars a square foot for an average dollar per square foot. Now, should you do that for every single house? I'm going to have to sit here and tell you no. But if you do eighty dollars a square foot, you're going to be a heck of a lot closer than doing one hundred and eighty dollars a foot what the house might be selling for. Because when we make our dollar per square foot adjustments, we are not doing the total one hundred eighty dollars or two hundred dollars or one hundred fifty dollars, whatever it's sold for. That total dollar per square foot that the house sold for includes the land, the house, the driveway, the air condition, any adjustment. Again, go look at that appraisal and see how many line item adjustments we can make that equals that total dollar per square foot. So if you see an appraisal and the house sold for $200 a foot and the appraiser is adjusting $200 per square foot just for the square foot adjustment, they're probably not gonna be appraising long because that's incorrect. It's rarely, I don't know if it's ever gonna be that situation. Um, Tommy, can you hear us? same floor plan. One, uh, they're both 20 years old. One has had no updates. The house next door has had been completely remodeled. Granted, new kitchens, new baths, new floor, new lights, all the way just gone through all the way. Is the price per foot the same on those two houses? They are the same house. Is the price per foot going to be the same one? Both the same house. Uh, yeah. So that's where price per foot just doesn't make sense to us. It, it will, it will. And the other thing to piggyback with that is your dollar per square foot can change from a 2,000, let's just say you have the same exact builder in the same subdivision and one house is 2,000 square feet and one house is, is 2,500 square feet. That 500 square feet difference could be, I mean, literally a $10 square foot difference. So if you go in and just average the dollar per square foot and you have a range in a subdivision, like I was just in, uh, I was in, uh, Robinson Crossing this morning. If you go and just type in Robinson Crossing, you take every, just the average dollar per square foot in that subdivision, you're gonna include homes that are 15 years old, to new homes, to the zero lot lines, to the big lots. And if you take that average dollar per square foot and just slap it on your seller's price and say, hey, this is what your house is worth, you might get lucky. But I would say it's probably 10% or less that you're gonna get lucky that that's gonna be right. And you don't wanna be that listing agent looking at that appraisal that's selling for thirty or forty thousand dollars more than what you listed that or appraising for thirty or forty thousand dollars more than what you listed to that. So that's the scary thing of just going in and doing a CMA and getting an average dollar per square foot for a subdivision because you really need to break down and I'm not sure we're gonna have time for this. We may have to come back in another month or two and have another one of these. But one of the things we've talked about doing is showing y'all how we get into MLS and pull comps. Um, I personally go off school districts, but I also will draw a polygon on there and actually draw my boundaries in. And I don't want to step on any of y'all's toes, but if you don't map the property correctly, and now that I'm an agent and I put a listing in there, don't trust that computer to say, this house is located right here. You, you will not understand how many times we do this search in Lewisburg, but there was a street that was close to whatever the new street is in Lewisburg that's in Horn Lake. So that automated mapping program is picking up the map and they're putting that, that house in Horn Lake, but it's supposed to be in Lewisburg. So as an agent, one, you don't want your seller to see that you didn't map it right, but as appraisers, we would love to just draw a polygon and trust that that mapping program is right. But unfortunately, too many houses are outside and not listed correctly, it's primarily on the new construction ones. Um, and it's just like when you go into your phone and you type in the address and your phone doesn't pull out the address and you're trying to map it. It's the same thing with the, with the computer. Um, so, I know we were trying to get to that. I don't know if we're going to have time to really go through that. But that's... Going back to the $80 square foot that you said, 
Is that and that's not gospel. Don't no, please I'm, tell us to do that every time. What's the eighty dollars? Is that just the house and you add back the land? That's just the heated square footage. The heated and cooled square footage, nothing else. That's not bathrooms, that's not garages, that's not pools, that's okay. not age, quality, condition, square uh that's land the square footage. And, no, no, and no. with that McKeever saying if you're if you're getting ready to list a house that's twenty two hundred feet and you're looking at sales and you see a twenty three or a twenty a two thousand square foot house, that's what he's getting at where that eighty dollars per foot or some number will come into play when you're trying to put a proper value on your property. Close to it. And don't take that eighty. Don't take that eighty dollars a foot and run. I mean, that it's really kind of an example, but um, you can't do the total uh, total dollar per square foot that that house is selling for. If you do that, you're going to be in a really dangerous situation. Even, especially if you have a ten thousand square foot lot and a twenty five thousand square foot lot in the same subdivision, they're probably and could be a lot of value difference. Uh, but if you just make a dollar per square foot adjustment. You could be double dipping, you could be way high or way low. It could work both ways with it. So two things I would say, mapping and square footage in those listings are gonna be very, very important information down the road. And it could potentially help you with another house you're selling in the same subdivision. If that square footage is wrong, it's all we have to go off of. So it could help or it could hurt you. And oftentimes it hurts you more than it helps you in getting that value in the next one because we're just stuck with what we got. Okay, and when y'all go to list the house, first question I always ask is, do you have a copy of the normal price? I want to see the sketch of the property and proper square footage on it. Uh, if copy, you, the, copy of the what? The sketch. Sketch. Mm -hmm. It shows the square footage of the home. Uh, or, or just a full, a lot of them will have a full appraisal. Lenders give them a copy at closing or should. So a lot of them have it. It's just a matter of where they keep it. So, okay, so if they don't have it, they do not have a copy of the appraisal. What are you going to use? You going to go to those tax records and use that? No. Everybody, please, big no. 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 <laughs> please don't use the tax records. The only time tax records may be close is a one-story, single-story home that the garage has no garage and maybe a carport, but a, the assessor does go out and physically measure the perimeter on the downstairs of the home. If it's a garage, they've got a certain calculation that they factor in for the garage to deduct it out of that base area. The base is what they think the first floor is close to. The adjusted includes all other types of calculations. What they estimate, a certain percentage for the upstairs, the garage, none of that is meant to be correct for use. Actually, one of my listings, they, they just did an appraisal on it and it had the bases. So he, we had to, I, he had to put the, uh, and I changed it for the additional heated square foot, and that had the basement information in there. Right. right. Anything below grade as appraisers, we have to count it as, we have to put it in a basement area on an appraisal. It's counted separately. It doesn't mean it doesn't have value. You go into some markets like out at Edo the Lakes, uh, Bridgetown, around the lake, where it's common, and those lower levels that walk out basement was finished and similar quality to the rest of the house and it's market acceptable. Uh, there may not be a difference. We may just be dividing out those areas into two, two separate areas, above grade and below grade. Uh, but, yes ma'am. Yes, so yes, so you, there, there's a place to put square footage in when you close it out. There's also a commentary place that you can go in and you can say uh, appraiser square footage was this. It also included an 800 square foot finished basement. That's wonderful. Any information we all can put in. Look, I understand. You don't want you don't want to put all this stuff in and the house smells like cigarettes. The house smells like dog pee. You don't want to do that. And the listing that's not helping market it for your client. But when you close it out, the marketing is through. When you close it out, go in and put a pet over it. Go in and put cigarette smoke. That way we can see why the house sold lower than the other houses around it. It gives us a reason to exclude it if we don't need to use it. Uh, so anything in those commentary when you get ready to close it out, great. So if you do not have a, a sketch from an appraisal, when you go to list a house, what do you do? Uh, 
Call an appraiser. Call an appraiser. Most all appraisers will measure a house for you. We do a lot for our realtor members, uh, measuring homes for you prior to listing. Um, it, one square foot typically will pay for an appraisal on their a drawing and sketch on the property. Um, I was going to piggyback on what, what, what Keever just said a while ago about the, the $80 per square foot thing, just, you know, whatever. But he was talking about not, um, you know, whatever the neighborhood is selling for on a per square foot basis, that's not what you adjust. So what I've done up here on the top is I took Greenbrook subdivision in the last six months and every sale in Greenbrook, and I did scrub the data because it was one burnout and sold like 62 grams, took it out of the data. So these are all arm's length, decent homes. Stuff in Greenbrook, you know, probably 125 to 150 bucks a square foot, typically, or, you know, somewhere in that ballpark. So I did what we call a regression analysis. What this is, it takes and calculates, um, gives me a price per square foot adjustment. This I use this on a daily basis. So you can see the, the here are the sales, that, see the square footage over here? And you see the sale prices on the right. I put a chart in there, then I put a, uh, a trend line and it shows me that for every square foot increase, the price increased by $68. That's how square footage impacts price. So it's not full price per square foot. I'm not trying to, this, I'm not telling you guys to do this. I'm just trying to show you the difference in, you know, not, not what they're selling for. This is what actually, this is how much a square footage impacts the value of the house. And if you want a simpler way to do it, you get two houses in Greenbrook yeah. that's all. Yeah. Subtract the difference in sale prices, subtract the difference in square footage, and divide those two together. Yeah. And you see what what the additional yeah. square footage from. Neil's going technical. Uh, I'm sure he blew a lot of people's mind, including mine. When I need this, I call Neil. And uh, so, yeah, but just, just get two houses that, uh, you know, are, are somewhat close, maybe a couple hundred square feet apart, and check sale prices versus differences in square footage to buy those two and that tells you about how much we show that the public was willing to pay for that additional square footage. And I was just doing that for reference to show you to kind of explain to you that hey you know just because it's selling for 120 a foot I mean that's what you adjusted per square foot so um, there's a lot of different ways like Bill said paired sales you can I've seen some crazy stuff but you know basically your paired sales regression stuff like that, that that's where we get our numbers. So there's a process you can go through with any appraisal. The EA has a specific process called Tidewater. I've got one sitting in Tidewater right now. If uh, with VA, if uh, we, once we start working on an appraisal, I go out and look at the property I see already and it's coming in, it's gonna be less than contract price. I have to notify the lender, I usually notify the listing agent as well. And there's a 48 hour time frame for the parties involved to submit sales if they won't consider. Uh, those have to be submitted on a grid, just like an appraisal form. So if you've not seen an appraisal form and you get a uh, notice of Tidewater or a VA loan, uh, you'll become uh, very familiar with it quick. Where do you get the grid? The lender should supply it for you. Uh, they have access to it. So with VA, you go in and submit the sales. You have to adjust them out just like an appraisal would. You have to put a adjusted value showing that you think that house supports value or what, what value it indicates. You send that back through the lender and then the lender forwards everything back to us. Uh, with conventional FHA, anything like that, my personal opinion, I've done it myself. I've had the same situation come up. Uh, appraisal come down and didn't know the nuances of the big development where there are differences in certain sections of the development and three pages later on a Sunday afternoon when I got to writing my rebuttal and a, an official appeal uh, and sent it back to that lender uh, the appraisal revised the report the following day so you cannot call us and discuss value ever on a property that we're appraising Y'all know that. If you don't know that, then please don't do that. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be short uh, when we answer you, so we can't discuss it. Uh, I'm sorry. 
I'll, I'll try to make it friendly. But uh, you're going to take it the wrong way because you're already calling me over an issue of value. We cannot discuss value. Subtle or law. And I don't look at it horizontal strike. And I like him. So I'm not going to prison. Uh, so, but you can call us and discuss repair issues on a property. If y'all have questions, if we make repair requirements, you can call and ask us about that. We can explain. I don't know it's a, it's a round corner on the face on the left side. Uh, you can, we can discuss those things. We just cannot discuss value at all. Uh, I sent that tide water in yesterday. They call and said, what value are you coming in at? So I can't discuss that with you. No, no, Tidewater is one DJ specific. Military has all these. Okay, is it a conventional or FHA? It's conventional. Okay. So conventional, what you do, what I would do. Okay, I sit down at full sale. And I write a summary on each sale of why the sale should have been included. I put the address, the MLS number, sale date, purchase price, details on that sale, and how it compares to my property. I do that with every one. Like I say, the last one I wrote an appeal on was three pages long when I got through with it and sent it to the lender the following day. I put on the, the top of it, this is an official request for an evaluation appeal for this property address. And look, y'all, there are cases I look all the time. I was, I, I text agents. I'm looking, trying to appraise a property, especially new construction where prices continue to change and there are pending sales in there and the pin date on it, it shows it was supposed to close a week or two weeks ago and it's still pending. So I call and say, hey, do you, is it closed yet? Oh, it closed a week and a half ago. Well, it's still pending and I don't have that sale. And so that, that hurts. I mean, we need that. Yeah, I closed one. Uh, I closed one a few weeks ago. And it took, need to be fine. Don't put them in there. It takes weeks sometimes to get them closed out. A lot of times the agents themselves may be bigger offices, may be big. Y'all, the agents closing sales out themselves. No, we have someone who takes that yeah. in our office. So that, that there's a delay there sometimes. <laughs> touch on this for 30 seconds and then uh, Neil's going to show y'all a, uh, a search in MLS and kind of how we narrow down comps. 
Um, if you have not heard about property data collectors, Fannie Mae has recently passed a rule that you can, um, that your, your buyers don't have to have a full appraisal anymore if they qualify. Good credit, low equity or high equity, whatever. Um, if you're the listing agent and a property data collector contacts you, it's a broker question for you, but from my understanding, by law, you have to let them in as if they're the appraiser. But know that an appraiser is not coming to the house. So uh, that property data collector is going to come to the house, measure it. Uh, there's rumors online. I have not seen this with my own eyes. I've, I've verbally have heard that it's fifty to seventy-five dollars. These property data collectors are getting paid. They come to the house, take some pictures, measure the house, quality condition notes, send it back to the appraiser who's sitting inside their house or office. The appraiser types a report and sends it in. So if you have a question on a repair, you're a listing agent. You call the appraiser, he can't tell you because he never went to the house. You're going to track down a property data collector who's not licensed. Um, could be an insurance agent, could be a real estate agent, could be a fireman, could be a policeman, whoever. Part time, part time pay for them. Um, but you're going to have somebody in the house that's, in my opinion, not qualified. Now, if you're the buyer, you're the buyer's agent. My advice to you, again, check with your broker. Each office may be different. My advice to you, and, and this is a biased opinion, but I'm going to say this as, a, as an agent. Um, you, you want an appraiser representing your buyer. You, you don't want a property data collector. And, and my fear for you as the buyer's agent, two or three years they go to sell it, and now you're the listing agent. They paid too much, the property wasn't appraised properly. There could be repairs that the property data collector didn't say anything about, and now you're on the hook trying to explain this to your seller, and they have a buyer that doesn't have good enough credit for getting a full appraisal done. This is gonna be a nightmare in the next five to 10 years. What, what um, alone are doing that? Everything. Uh, FHA's not doing them yet, but FHA, I'll usually always follow them. Give them a year or two and they'll probably follow them. What do they follow? Following conventional. Mm -hmm. So it's primarily conventional now. I don't know what VA is not doing that. VA is typically the last one to fall in line with everything else. Yeah, so also, they are also Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and uh, they're, they're coming out with these products to where they're trying to do appraisal waivers completely meaning you're getting nothing but an electronic valuation on the property. So your your contracts, even though they're contingent on an appraisal, they're not, there's not an appraisal taking place. Your buyer has the right to have a full appraisal on that property. The lenders approach them, or the, uh, I assume some lenders will approach them with uh, the fact that, oh, it's going to save you money. You're not going to have to spend, instead of $500, you're only going to have to spend $200 for an automated valuation. I don't think that's a good plan. I would never let my buyer yeah, have that. So I want my buyer to have a full price. Uh, Do they first think of, he had to let him in? So as a listing agent, I'm not going to let him in. <laughs> now, if you, at least I'm representing, if you ask my broker. <laughs> yeah. So if you are representing the buyer, and I, I get a property data collector that comes to me wanting to get into my listing. We'll say you call the, the buyer's agent and they will have to accompany you. That that person has no E and O insurance. That person has not been vetted as far as any licensure or anything through the state. Uh, you're letting somebody into your house that you know nothing about. Well, and we have background checks done on us as appraisers at least every two years when our license is renewed. And, and then we have mortgage companies that are doing background checks on us. So I don't, I have no idea how these property data collectors are, I, I don't know how they found them. I've had some phone calls to inquire about me being okay, a property data a collector. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am, they're through a company. I mean, they've called me and asked me to be the property data collector and I quoted my fee and they pretty much hung up on me. So <laughs> I, I just, I mean, and it's, it's, I measure for some of y'all. I know I'm not the cheapest, but I mean, I'm not doing it cheaper than what I measure a house for. I mean, I just, it, it seems crazy to go by and then, the next thing, and this doesn't really affect y'all too much, but as us, as us as appraisers, if we're the appraiser sitting in our office typing the report, all this information came from a third party data collector at the house, and two years from later, there's a lawsuit or something goes wrong, we're the appraiser that's liable for it, not the property data collector, because they don't have the ENO. Right, right, so they don't have the ENO, they don't have any schooling as far as I know. If they did do schooling, it's a quick 30 minute deal online. They're not AMT trained to measure a house. But they have to have an appraiser accept it. I mean, they have to have an appraiser willing to set it. They call it a desktop appraisal. But you're willing to take this on a bifurcated or hybrid appraisal where there's one party going out gathering data and the appraiser themselves are sitting at their desk. My 
signature will never be on one. Yeah, one time. Well, you, you can't stop it. It's your fiduciary responsibility to to allow the sale to go through, and if that's what the buyer's doing, again, a broker question. That's probably something. I'll take the other thing. As a broker, I'm not going to go let them. You may not let them. Not I don't think you can keep them because. I mean, you I can't. Holly, if you're representing the buyer, I'm going to say, okay, Holly, you take them and let them in, and it's your responsibility. If they mess up anything in the house, but as a listing agent, I don't think you can stop it. Yes, ma'am. As a buyer's agent, you can stop it. Yes, ma'am, over here. What other um, downsides for a seller, other than the safety issue and, and, and that, would it not affect them? Right. Other than letting an unvetted person in their house that they have no clue about anything. Uh, we don't know anything about them. The appraiser that's going to value the property doesn't even, at the best of my knowledge, they don't have an idea of who the data collector even was. Yeah. yeah. Square so footage right, issues. This knowledge gets out of anybody's driveway. Well, you could be a data collector. That's right. Yeah. I thought what Holly was just asking about. Right. There is no good luck with the reconsideration of value. I mean, if yeah. the value is an issue and you go back to the appraisal, I've never sold a house. I just go off what they have. Okay. I don't know if it's right or not. So I have to put my broker head out. So my contract for my buyer is contingent on the price. If this lender decides to order a automated valuation on the property and bypass the appraisal, if your contract has not been fulfilled, that contingency has not been removed. That is not an appraisal. So, right, there's an issue that brokers need to address this because these ABMs are going, you're going to see more and more push for them from Fannie Mae. So, no, as brokers, you better make sure that that there's amendments to contracts if the appraisal is not going to take place uh, so that that contingency is removed from your contract. Otherwise, you're sitting there with an appraisal contingency on the contract and it's never satisfied. And, and, more it's yeah. and when y'all leave here today, you're probably gonna ask, why are they doing this? It's to save money and to save time. Absolutely. But I, 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 I don't see how saving money and saving time gets two different parties to do one appraisal. Right. You need, I would want the buyer to sign a waiver of an appraisal with that. Yeah. If, if, They're not if, appraisal. They might give them all the square footage and everything. Everything. You don't know what's being. I would get someone to sign because when they go to a sale and something on that data plate and we participate in it. And the thing about the, like us on, from our appraiser side of it, we cannot make an assumption that that data is accurate. So we just have to take it at its face. And then like, like the keeper said, if, if something goes wrong, we're the ones that's gonna be liable for it. I will not do that. Yeah. Um, well, that means that y'all will have to stick your project pretty much down and not- Well, that's, 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 that's not gonna happen either. Yeah, right? yeah, but, <laughs> <we're> starting, <laughs> if it keeps going, y'all will have a different face up here. And I'll yeah, because it's, uh, it's starting to get now, especially since work's gotten so slow. That these AMCs, because they're not making the volume, they don't have the volume to make up. They're sending over full appraisals for two hundred bucks. I know I'm not supposed to talk about price, but oh, it, it is what it is. You're not going to get anybody that knows what they're doing for two hundred dollars. <laughs> so y'all, when the keeper said, "Ask your broker what we do," which is usually a disclaimer I did put on. What we just talked about is they ask your broker question. Go back and talk to your brokers about these appraisal waivers. The lenders require uh, doing these automated valuations, and see what you're supposed to do. And then, Are these the dot com lenders? No. Lenders? No, you'll see all kind of lenders starting to do this with Fannie Mae products soon. Yes. They're gonna score that buyer in the system when they put it in and it's gonna come up with an option for an appraisal waiver or an automated valuation to be done on the property rather than an appraisal. It was a it was a Fannie Mae directive that went effective April fifth fourteenth. So last Friday it came live. I had one that closed in Winston. Yeah, I would. I think I would. A lot of commercials can do it. I would. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm going to buy as much buyer's property as I can. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm going to buy as much buyer's to not accept that and, and go ahead and request the full price. That's my personal opinion. If they choose to do it, I'm, there'll be a waiver. Absolutely. Right. Right.
communication with your buyer and lender. I, I think you just have to communicate. It's probably going to require more communication with the buyer and lender now. Uh, stating, hey, what, has the price been ordered? You know, we haven't heard anything, and I've got a, I have an appraisal contingency in my contract, and it hasn't been satisfied. What is the, do y'all order the appraisal and it's going to take place? And then if they come back and tell you then, well, the buyer is elected to do a, waiver on the appraisal and go to the ABM, uh, I think you've got some paperwork to do. And then another thing, you, you can also go to the, the appraisal board website. I use that on my, very often to check who did some appraisals. On, that way I can call and verify, but just check their names. Whoever calls you on the appraisal board website, see if they're actually a licensed or certified appraiser. Uh, so it's a five second search on the on MAB dot whatever it is. Just I can school Mississippi appraisal board. Is that more with the mortgage company? Uh, it will be more the mortgage company on Fannie Mae products right now. What is the name of the, You're not going to know in the initial offer. You're not going to know in the initial offer. It will be down the loan process probably when this comes up. Any loan officers in the in here? Chris, you know? So. As a listing, I think the days are over that somebody calls and says, hey, I want to go to the house tomorrow. This is McKeever. I want to go between two and four, and y'all just say okay. Uh, those days are kind of over because you're supposed to put the appraiser's name in MLS. But I think to protect your seller, you really need to know who you who it is, how, who, is li who they licensed with. They're not going to be members of the board because they're not licensed. Right. They're they, not won't, licensed. They, won't they won't have, have, have key box access. So you'll so have to meet one of the agents will have to let them in. But I, what I'm saying is, I don't want. Yeah, data collector is not coming in uh, in my house. Yeah. It's not accompanied by a license. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Start talking to the buyer. Yeah, start talking to them about appraisals. I got educated on this by a building in Senatopia a couple months ago. They, the commercial appraiser center, they never, the appraiser was out of Jackson. They never came, never set foot in Senatoga. They had a company come out. They never, they, they never set foot in the uh, in the building. They walked around the outside of the building, took a bunch of pictures, and made some notes and, and sent it back to the appraiser. And that's what the appraiser did the appraisal off of. Never set foot in. It was a little lower than normal. It. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's raised. It was. It was. It was kind of embarrassing. Yeah. I, I was embarrassed. For the lender. Why? Well, because we were buying the property and it was it was ridiculous what we had to pay a thousand bucks for. For appraiser who never stepped foot in this building. Do y'all have energy for a quick search or y'all want to hold off till next time? It's almost one thirty. It's after one thirty. Yeah, it's it? Let's go ahead and wrap this up and. and uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, I've got time. If y'all want to deal, you want to work. Okay. If y'all want to stay, it's fine. I'm good. Mine's only willing to absorb. Tommy, we got ten minutes. Huh? We got ten minutes. Five. 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 Well, um, we're going to do a little little quick search. I'm going to just do a gravy one, the, something in DeSoto Central, just to kind of show you guys what, what I do. I think McKeever and Bill and I, we are all on the same page. Um, typically what I do, I take my subject. Let's just say it's 2,000 square feet built in 2015, okay? Uh, basic house in, in DeSoto Central, the South Haven area. 
So typically what I like to do is I like to go 300 feet below, 300 feet above. So I'll do a search from 1,700 to 2,300 square feet. So I'll click here. Uh, 1,700. Well, and if y'all don't have it, you still see the top left where it says deals residential. I've got one that says deals residential. <laughs> you can go in and build those fields in there for a customer. So you've got that, all those fields built in as a template. Every time. So I've got one field land. And uh, so I've got all the fields saved in it. But let's just say, it's like I said, built in 2015. Typically, I do probably 2010 to 2020 on year build. Uh, sometimes I go back a little further, depending on what the house is like. So 2010 to 2020. And then I'll come down here to where it says high school. Click on, click on it and go to, I'll type in DeSoto Central. Then I'll, I will, I normally do this first, but normally I'll just, as you know, there's a distinct difference in South Haven and Olive Branch, even though they're both in the Soto School District. I like to stay in the same uh, taxing area, just for, for comparison purposes. Now, if I need to pop over to Olive Branch for the fifth or sixth comp, I will, but I'll just type in South Haven. And, and Nez, yeah, because you pick up uh, pick up uh, Williams Ridge and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of Nesbitt area along yeah, Fall Lane Road is actually there. within the city of South Haven. So, city limits. I will go back Usually what I start with first is the first 90 days. So I start from January 1st, 2023, obviously a little over 90 days, but that shows you there's been 11 sales in that range of property uh, in that market area in the past 90 days. And that gives you a list. Then I start narrowing it down by school district. I mean, by, excuse me, by subdivision. I'll take it over here, then I'll, I'll send them down, then I'll start, picking, I'll start picking my sales out of my neighborhood first. Then I'll start looking for competing sales and just kind of see where we are. Then if I don't have what I need or don't have enough data I think that I need, to, that I can hang my hat on, I'll back it back to six months. Then I have to back it back to a year. Uh, it just depends on, on what you got. Now, if you're in Tate County on 5,000 square feet on 10 acres, probably gonna be looking about two years, um, you know, for anything with a pulse down there. So, um, but here where the market is just, just has a pretty decent amount of data, there's really no read to go back past 90 days unless there's just something, a, a huge anomaly out there. But you can see, like I said, you have 11 houses. And, and there's really not a big distinct difference if you look here between the neighborhoods. Um, they're all basically about the same. Um, so that tells us, you know, hey, there's not, buyers really don't care about neighborhood. They want school district or they want whatever, you know. Um, and that's kind of how some of the searches we do. Then you start narrowing it down by amenities. Uh, bathrooms, bedrooms, garage spaces, things of that nature, and just start picking the ones that are most similar to your to your property that you're dealing with. I mean, that's that's just I, I think we all do things kind of the same way. We all kind of think alike and, and work alike and um, things of that nature. Now there there's some people that really don't know the market. Um, I, I reviewed an appraisal in uh, in Lakes of Nicholas. A dude used three comps out of a retreat of Center Hills. You just want to start closer and work your way out. I reviewed one in Southern Tokyo. You used all three sales out of uh, yeah. Lewis Park School District. Oh, my goodness. So they're all kind of Can crazy. you not do anything about that when you did something like that? Well, the, well they're reviewing it. It's being reviewed by the lender, but obviously it went through. The property closed. And uh, the lender didn't. Well, did it much higher value? It's a lender. Oh, yeah, it's a lender. It's a lender. But, Sometimes uh, the higher value is not the best thing. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So uh, you know, it, it, the only the only way an appraisal appraiser really gets in trouble is somebody files a complaint. Yeah. You go to the Mississippi Appraisal Board and, and a consumer files a complaint on an appraiser uh, that that does not think their appraisal was performed correctly, uh, <coughs> then yes, then they're they're we're we're gonna have to answer to the real estate board or the appraisal board. I will caution y'all be don't don't encourage complaints to the appraisal board. Okay. Um, there's the ethics thing there. Uh, but there's also you're probably if you if, if the investigator for the appraisal board finds out about that, you're probably gonna have an investigator from the real estate commission call you. <laughs> And so you, you may be opening up a can of worms that you don't want. So be very cautious and encourage.
encouraging consumers to file complaints on appraisal. Yes, ma'am. I've I've got I'm the geek of the bunch obviously, um, so I keep I keep uh, stuff I go back to every I keep what we call fair sales analysis and stuff in so many different markets and I keep a, a database of stuff like that and I've extracted some sales out of past sales or some values for a pool out of past sales and I kind of hang my hat on those but it, it's like Bill was explaining a while ago on the. Uh, uh, the square footage, you try to find a house with a pool that's sold, a house without a pool, and that gives you about what a buyer's willing to pay for a pool. Um, but it's it definitely not going to be what they cost, I promise you that. Okay. Yes, cost and market value are two different things. And if you've got the same principle, big workshops, you have a month workshop, you get in there and dig and MLS and find sales that, that have workshops. And then compare them to the houses that sold without them. It'll give you some rough idea of how, what the contributory value of that workshop is. Yes, yes. Now you might have to do a comparison in that neighborhood. If you go outside of where you're looking, say if you're in Cherry Tree and you have to go all the way to Olive Branch and you're still in the summer price range, but you go to a different neighborhood over there, then you may have to do a, a, a kind of an analysis of that swimming pool sale compared to other homes without a swimming pool. I have an idea. This is a luxury, blah, blah, blah. You know what I found? Yeah. A swimming pool in the backyard is a swimming pool. Swimming pool. Yeah. If they, if they can get know. in it and drink a margarita, they're happy. Yeah. So it goes kind of back to like what Bill was talking about a while ago about the, about the houses. It's, it's super advocacy. If you got a Lucas Lagoon's pool, if y'all have ever watched that uh, Animal Planet or whatever, you know, with the grottos and stone and, you know, $200,000 pool. They, somebody just might as well give me the hundred fifty thousand extra that they paid. And we'd all be happier because um, it pulls pool, right? Yeah. And now, uh, look, I've, I've 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 seen them where they go in and put a hundred fifty thousand dollar pool in the backyard, and it's beautiful. And but that typical buyer is looking at it like, thank you, <laughs> thank you for doing that. So yeah, uh, your your value you're going to get return on it is probably. No different than that 18 by 36 vinyl, two doors open. But 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 to answer your question, looking for sales. See, I've got on my on my save thing. I've got pool. So if I'm looking for a pool comp, I just click that. Okay. And if it's got a pool, yes. And out of the 25 sales in the last six months, only one sale in, the, in that market has had a pool. Look at what's funny. 2,100 feet sold for 3475. Uh, yeah, there we go. Yeah. So 2,150 feet sold for 3475. Take the pool off. So here's 25 other sales, all of them about the 2,150 feet. There's 2,107 feet in the same neighborhood for 350. How much does that pool at? search when he's trying to appraise a property like that and he types in you know 
1,800 to 2,200 square foot houses, it's going to kick that out if it's got 3,000 people. So you're, you're putting data in that's not factual or true. And, uh, if you put it in, it's 3,000 people. Well, I think you put it in there and say it's 3,000. But then they have to provide it down here. They, and they can do that. Yeah, I think that's a broken question. Yeah, yeah. ask your broker how they want it done. One, one more thing on that, what you just said, it, one of it struck me pretty good, but you said it was detached, not attached to the same root line. Check with the zoning, because in the county and the city of South Haven, they have to be attached to the same root line of the house or they're not permitted. And, they, and the city of Fernando does not allow them at all. But it didn't have a breezeway. Yeah, but if, like I said, but if it's not attached with a breezeway or something to the main root line, it's not legal. There's all kind of crazy guidelines. Well, it did have a closed-in breezeway. Uh, it did have the roof line. Okay, okay. Well, that, but just, like I said, just, just different stuff like that. And I, me personally, I, I agree with Bill. I would appreciate if y'all separated out because that makes it easier for us to find the search and, and searches. And I keep a running track of, like, in-laws that have sold and ones that didn't without it. And I get a per-foot basis of value of the in-laws. So if you if that's not separated out and we never know, then an underwriter calls up and says, hey, I need a comp at the, an in-law quarters. We can't find it. And on FHA, even if it's accessible from inside the house, you just have a wing built off the back of the house that has a full in-law suite with a full kitchen, bedroom, sleeping area, and a bathroom. We have to divide that for an FHA appraisal. We cannot include that in the gross living area right. on FHA. They say we must separate. Just one more monkey wrench to throw in. <laughs> Conventional, we do not. For Fannie Mae loans, we do not. But FHA, uh, if it's a in-law suite with a full in-law suite, kitchen, sleeping area, bathroom, we have to divide it out of the pro sleeping area. Any more questions? When are y'all going to have a class on that flow?